All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for Holly thesis defense. I'm Scott Hamilton, one of Holly's advisors here at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, and I'm joined by Cheryl Logan, who's her advisor at CSU Monterey Bay, and we, we could by Holly for the thesis. Uh, so just to, um, to remind you of the etiquette of the thesis defense before we get going with the introduction. So please keep yourself unmuted uh, during the defense. And please don't try to turn your video on or share your screen. Uh, when Holly's done with the defense, then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions live uh, at the end. And so if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can raise use the raise your hand feature, which is located under the reactions tab, which is the bottom of the Zoom screen. So click on reactions and then find the little raise your hand tool. Hit that, that'll notify us, and then we will call on you. And at that point, we'll ask you to turn your video on so Holly can see you and you can ask her a question. And then don't forget to lower your hand afterwards and we'll call on the next person. And then at the very end, we will encourage everyone then after the questions to turn on their videos and to unmute themselves and uh, give Holly a big congratulations. All right, so a little introduction for Holly. So Holly started here at Moss Landing. She started in the biological oceanography lab. And, but after a couple of years decided to transition to work with me and with Cheryl. Uh, given her passion to study fishes, which she had expressed when she was interviewing uh, for grad school. So in the end, it really worked out. Holly was a fantastic addition to both of our labs, and she completed her thesis in about three years once she moved over uh, to working with us on a very challenging project that she'll tell you about, examining gene expression in rockfish in response to climate change, where she used a bunch of molecular techniques and learned the, the field of bioinformatics, which is very uh, complicated. And so it's very impressive what she's been able to accomplish. No. Cheryl, you want to say anything first before we get going? Um, yeah, I'll just say that um, Holly joined, as Scott said, uh, our labs in 2018, the summer of 2018, and did almost all of her lab work in that first year and learned how to do all the bioinformatics and the computer programming that she needed for her thesis very, very quickly. Um, both of us were extremely impressed with her progress so early on um, as she joined the project. And as you'll see today, she generated just an immense amount of data um, that she has eloquently distilled down into her presentation that you'll hear about um, in just a minute. Uh, but before we hear more about the amazing science that she's done while she's been at Moss Landing, we're gonna tell you a little bit more about what it was like having Holly um, at Moss Landing over the past few years. Scott? All right, so a little background. Of course, Holly, like many of her students, has a love for the ocean, right, and for fish. You can see here that I think when she was a kid, she was probably a better angler than I still am today. And, you know, despite growing up in the Midwest, in Missouri, she was really determined to become a marine biologist. So I look back at, at Holly's uh, application to Moss Landing, and she wrote, you know, although I love animals in general, I was never the little girl who had an obsession with kittens, puppies, horses, or all things fluffy. You know, There'll be a few uh, photos coming up at the end, so you can be a judge of the veracity of that statement. She said, instead, I was fascinated by the organisms that lived in the vast aquatic world that I only knew from books and movies. I was seven years old the first time I got to see the ocean, and the experience strengthened my passion to learn about marine organisms. That was the first time I saw tide pools and had the opportunity to marvel at strange alien creatures like sea urchins. I spent so much time crouching to look at the little ecosystem, I didn't notice the tide coming in and ended up soaked from head to toe on a brisk October day. Returning home from that trip only left me wishing that I could someday return to the coast and experience the ocean and its wonders again. And she has definitely been able to do that as she came out here to California. Right? She also remarked that she had a big collection of shark books. She's always been excited about sharks. And uh, she even had the nickname of Shark Lady uh, when, when she was a kid. Sure. I did, did not know that. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, on Holly's journey to become a marine biologist, she actually first started off studying zebrafish. Um, so at the University of Missouri, Mizzou, where she was an undergraduate, she actually published two papers before coming to graduate school. She led a paper um, on the neurobiology and behavior of zebrafish. Um, and I think that got her even more excited to get out to the coast to work on marine organisms. So um, as I said, or as Scott mentioned earlier, she started off in the biological oceanography lab and then joined um, my lab and Scott's lab in summer of 2018. Um, we had a project that was funded by the NSF to study the behavior, physiology, and gene expression of um, several species of rockfish under, under climate change and future projection, 
future projected changes in upwelling. Um, and so Holly joined our team to basically lead the transcriptomics portion of um, this fluctuating, uh, these fluctuations in ocean acidification and hypoxia that rockfish might be exposed to under future climate change. And while she's been at Moss Landing and at CSUMB, she has become a, a true scholar, mentor, and teacher. Um, she has worked as a research assistant in the biological oceanography lab, um, in Scott's lab, as well as in my lab. She's presented national level presentations at the Ocean Sciences Meeting, as well as at SICP, the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, on her thesis research last year. Uh, she's won uh, three different awards, the Moss Landing Marine Labs Wave Award in 2018 and again in 2020, as well as the Moss Landing Scholar Award um, in 2019. Um, and she's also contributed in numerous ways um, to the community through her through teaching and, and mentoring as well. She was a TA for the biological oceanography class at Moss Landing, and she was also a TA for my class um, in marine experimental physiology at CSUMB. Um, and in addition to the semester where she, she was a TA, she also came and gave, gave guest lectures to the undergraduates in my class that semester and in subsequent semesters and assisted the class in lab work, um, which included the kinds of skills that she used in her thesis. So extractions of RNA um, and then learning how to use computer programming to analyze sequence data for um, transcriptomics types projects. She was also a UROC mentor through our Undergraduate Research Opportunity Center. Um, and she was a fantastic uh, person to have in the lab um, for all of the undergraduates and her fellow lab mates um, throughout her time at Moss Landing. All right, Holly was also a real leader at the at Moss Landing and the Moss Landing community. So she served as the student body vice president uh, when she was here, she helped to organize a lot of the fun events in the lab, the Halloween parties, the bowling night, the lab Olympics, you know, and helping to raise, you know, different issues uh, that the students needed up to the, to the faculty. She was very heavily involved in the Moss Landing Open House, particularly the puppet show you can see down there in the lower right, where each year the students put on a brand new song and dance routine set to popular music, music uh, about ocean issues, you know, for kids and, and adults alike, and Holly was a big participant there. Right. She was also involved with the Society of, for Women in Marine Science and uh, helped out uh, with revamping the Moss Landing website, you know, among many other things. Right. Cheryl. Um, and so, yeah, as, as, as you've heard, um, Holly has been a great member of, of two different lab communities. So down here on the left is the ichthyology lab um, that Scott leads up. And then this is the Marine Experimental Physiology Lab that I, that I lead at CSUMB. And Holly has been, had the amazing opportunity to be part of both of these communities and, and really contribute um, to both communities in so many ways. Um, she has a really wide skill set that we'll talk about in just a minute, um, from the field to the lab work. And then also, as Scott mentioned, just being a great community member within the Moss Landing um, community itself. Uh, so, so Holly is, is really unique in that, you know, most of the students in my lab are really focused on molecular work and bioinformatics. And Holly came in being um, fairly experienced in her ability to work in the field and the lab. So she was a boat driver for a lot of the fish collections that we did. She's helped in the field with a lot of the other student projects um, in, in Scott's lab and in, with other students at Moss Landing. Um, she's also been a great lab, molecular lab assistant for students in my lab that are struggling or learning new um, lab techniques, molecular lab techniques. Um, she started uh, from scratch really with bioinformatics and is now a, a, a superstar R user and helps her lab mates um, with R all the time. Um, she worked really hard to extract the, the many RNA samples that you'll be hearing about in just a minute. Um, and really became an RNA extraction extraordinaire. And um, on top of all this, she's also just a really fantastic communicator. So you'll see that in her presentation today. And she also uh, worked on the sea goddess whale watching boat as a naturalist, this picture up here, um, where she communicated science to broader audiences as well. Scott? But of course, Holly also likes to have fun and let loose. <laughs> 
right? She said she doesn't like the fluffy things, but look, the dogs, right? The <laughs> unicorns, the, the costumes. I mean, she always had some of the most creative and fantastic costumes for the Halloween party and, and really like to let that artistic side as well shine. And um, yeah, so we'll miss that aspect as well, for sure, when, when she moves on here. <laughs> Carol. Um, and then finally, we just want to say uh, we, we, we've seen you over the years, Holly, and we know that you are going to have a, an amazing adventure after you finish here at Moss Landing, and we're looking forward to seeing where you go next um, and really looking forward to your talk today. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, let me get pulled up here and I'm gonna turn off my video so you don't see me like awkwardly move my hands while I give my presentation. Um, so. All right, so I think you should be set to see uh, my screen now. Um, and yeah, so thanks again, Scott and Cheryl um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I think I knew some of those photos existed, but <laughs> didn't realize that they were going to be coming to light today. I feel like that's the general theme as these intros go. Um, but I also want to thank everybody else today who took the time out of their day to tune in um, as I present my master's thesis defense. So this is explaining the species-specific transcriptomic responses of juvenile rockfish to simulated future upwelling conditions. So um, to help orient you to the flow of my presentation today, I have this outline here. So I'll start off with a brief introduction to help provide some background and key points about my research topic. Um, then I'll move into a simplified overview of my methods, followed by my results that are split into two parts. So the first part is going to focus on my species comparison, and that's followed by a brief discussion. And then the second part is going to focus on the individual species data. So that's again followed by a discussion. So I'll wrap everything up with some overall conclusions and then finish off with my acknowledgments. So without further ado, uh, let's dive in. So um, many of you probably already know that anthropogenic climate change is triggering large scale changes in ocean chemistry that are expected to worsen over the next few decades. So according to models using continued high CO2 emissions levels as input, or essentially if we're continuing on a business as usual path, um, by 2100, we can expect to see a triple threat of dramatic changes in temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen content um, in many of our world's oceans, as well as a variety of other downstream effects. So for example, the following figures show how these stressors are predicted to change by 2100. So the first figure on the left here shows changes in dissolved oxygen content in the oceans with cooler colors signifying large decreases in oxygen and warmer colors signifying um, large increases. Meanwhile, the figure on the right shows changes in surface pH or relative acidity with deeper red colors depicting increasing levels of acidity. So you should be able to see from both of these figures that if we do nothing to change our current climate change trends, um, majority of the world's oceans will be trending towards extremely acidic and hypoxic waters. And unfortunately, current ocean chemistry measurements are already trending in the more acidic and hypoxic direction today. So the combined effects of ocean acidification or OA, as I will refer to it in this presentation, um, and I, hypoxia is a topic that is especially interesting because these stressors often already occur in tandem in many of the world's coastal marine habitats, and specifically um, in the California current large marine ecosystem shown here on the right. So this ecosystem is already highly susceptible to increases in these specific environmental stressors due to characteristics of strong seasonal upwelling, which is a naturally occurring event that transports nutrient rich um, but also generally more acidic and hypoxic waters to the nearshore environment. Likewise, these stressors are predicted to worsen as temperate and polar or in temperate and polar regions, um, as research shows that climate change will drive the increased frequency and intensity of these upwelling events. So this means that they will be potentially occurring more often for longer time stretches and bringing more extreme conditions with them. <clears throat> 
And so this is all on top of the overall gradual increase of PCO2 in the ocean, which furthers acidification and the depletion of oxygen on a base level. And so currently, the peak upwelling season along the California coast typically takes place from spring through early summer. So this is around the same time as many juvenile fishes are settling in or what we, re we refer to as recruiting um, to near shore habitats. So thus, the compounding intensity of these environmental stressors could pose a threat to certain species. Studies looking into the effects of these stressors on marine fishes have become more abundant in the last decade or so, as it's become increasingly evident that exposure to OA and hypoxia can produce a variety of implications and impairments. So these include behavioral or neurosensory implications, developmental or muscular skeletal implications, um, metabolic implications, or in some cases of uh, certain species or individuals, even no effect at all. So the implications listed here represent only a small number of a growing list of ob observations that have been made over the last few years. However, um, many of these studies do not account for environmental fluctuations when they approach their experimental design. So this graph displays correlated temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen measurements that were collected from our study site in Stillwater Cove in the Monterey Bay of California. Um, so these measurements took place over seven consecutive weeks in the spring of 2017, um, which was during that year's onset of the upwelling season. So to help orient you to this graph a little bit better, the left y-axis shows the pH scale, the right y-axis shows both the temperature and dissolved oxygen scale, and the x-axis shows the collection time frame with dates at the bottom. So pH here is depicted in orange, dissolved oxygen in blue, and then temperature is in gray. And so what you should see um, from this graph is that these data clearly demonstrate that the pulses of cold, hypoxic, and acidic conditions that are correlated with upwelling are nowhere near consistent or what we call static in nature. So instead, they fluctuate a great deal back and forth between more normal and more extreme conditions over the seven weeks shown. Um, but if we were to plot some of the hypoxic and acidic treatment parameters from the studies from which the data on the previous slide were collected, it would look something more like this. So many of the studies to date looking at even ocean acidification and hypoxia as combined stressors tested these static or linear parameters rather than fluctuating parameters. So it's hard for us to know if we're getting an accurate portrayal of the implications when the experimental treatments don't closely resemble those that are occurring in nature. So of the few studies that have investigated OA and hypoxia in both static and fluctuating parameters, data show trends of significant differences in organismal responses to each condition. Additionally, um, some of these studies suggest the ability for fishes to fare better under fluctuating conditions due to an apparent ability to recover during relaxation periods that return to normal conditions, such as those that have been highlighted on the graph on the right. Um, however, data from other studies suggest this recovery might exist within certain tolerance thresholds and or it may camouflage prolonged effects of stress that are hidden at the cellular level. Thus, it's really vital for us to understand not only how changing ocean chemistry affects vulnerable fishes on a physiological level, but also on a molecular or a cellular level as well. So one great way for us to do so is to study an organism's gene expression through methods of transcriptomics and RNA sequencing. Um, and I know those are pretty jargony words, but stick with me here. Um, I'll explain those a little bit more in just a bit. And they're essentially the methods that I used for my thesis. But these techniques allow us to dive beneath the physiological surface and look at molecular changes that are driving um, physical responses that we can see. So to put all of this into context for you, um, fish like us need oxygen to breathe and to power many of their molecular functions. And so for both of us, hypoxic environments occur when there's not enough oxygen readily available. So a similar hypoxic experience that a human might have is being in a high altitude environment, um, such as you would find at the top of a mountain. So in this situation, unless you're an experienced climber, um, if you or I set out to climb that mountain tomorrow, we would likely end up very sick, showing physiological symptoms of increased breathing um, and resting heart rate, 
while under the surface, our cells are showing an increased expression of genes that are related to oxygen absorption, red blood cell production, and the development of new blood cells, our new blood vessels. So together, all of these symptoms display efforts of our bodies trying to increase oxygen supply to our vital organs as a result or as a response to that hypoxic environment. And so similarly, a fish that is under hypoxia or acidification stress, again, might show physiological symptoms of increased breathing and reduced swimming performance. Or if you remember from our earlier slide, some species or individuals might show little to no physiological effects at all. So in both of these examples, um, we can look for changes in the expression of genes to better understand the physiological responses. Um, but we can also use this to look for signs of stress as well. So some of the genes that we can specifically look for are those that are universally known to be part of the cellular stress response, also known as the CSR. So genes that fall within this category are historically pretty good indicators of detrimental cellular changes or impacts. And they can notify us of negative responses, even if things seem pretty close to normal at that physiological level. So in addition to the studies that show physiological responses of hypoxia and acidification, a growing number of studies have shown some examples of significant changes at the molecular level or in a gene expression, such as those examples listed here. And so at this point, um, you might be thinking, why should we care about or why should we be studying this in rockfish particularly? Well, uh, they have an incredibly diverse genus, or they are an incredibly diverse genus of fishes. So they account for at least 65 different species along the US West Coast alone. Um, and each of these species have diverse life history characteristics. So this includes the time that they're spending as larvae out in the open ocean developing, um, as well as the time that they are settling back in or what we call recruiting as juveniles to their coastal habitats. And so as a consequence, they occupy many different ecological niches of the same kelp forest habitat. They're also incredibly economically important to us as humans um, as part of our West Coast ground fish fisheries. And they tend to contribute around $15 million per year um, to our economy as local seafood. They also play ecologically important roles as both predators and prey to a variety of marine animals. So one example here on the left is the California sea lion that's preying on a rockfish for food. And then finally, they have long span, um, life spans during which they're slow growing and slow to reproduce. So this potentially makes their populations not as readily able to adapt to changing ocean conditions. So this thesis continues the investigation comparing gene expression responses to ocean acidification and hypoxia in two closely related juvenile rockfish species. I focus on comparing copper and gopher rockfish um, that occupy different niches of typically the same kelp forest habitats and exhibit different life history characteristics. So one of the most important differences between these two species is in the timing of their recruitment or again, when they're settling back into that kelp canopy. So for example, the coppers typically settle into the canopy from April to May, which is during the peak of that upwelling season, while gophers in comparison are recruiting slightly later towards the end of the upwelling season in June and July. So though it's only a few months or even a few weeks of difference there, um, the more time spent developing in environments that are naturally experiencing more fluctuations of stressor conditions, could cause the coppers to develop a greater tolerance than the gophers. And so finally, um, another, um, one main motivator for the study and its precursor is the work done by Melissa Palmiscano, which is currently in preparation. So she exposed the same juvenile gopher and copper rockfish used in this study to combine treatments of OA and hypoxia in both static and fluctuating conditions. So um, the data from that study show that the critical swimming speed and aerobic scope, which are two measurements of physiological performance and fitness, showed significant decreases with increasing stressors for both species. And then likewise, um, she found that after experiencing these decreases in physiological performance during those stressful periods, the juveniles that were sampled then at the end of the fluctuating relaxation treatments 
had measurements that were close to control fish. So this suggests that both species showed a physiological recovery during those relaxation periods. And then finally, um, her data show little to no significant differences between the species physiological responses. And so this suggests that gopher and copper rockfish responded nearly identically across all treatments. So moving on into my research questions and hypotheses. Um, based on Melissa's data and based on those physiological responses, I had three main questions that I wanted to answer. So the first question focused on that cross-species comparison, and it asked, how do gene expression responses for each species differ or compare across treatments? So I hypothesized that copper and gopher rockfish um, would exhibit a unique gene expression response on a broad scale, but also show a distinct shared set of responsive genes. So if my data supported this hypothesis, I expected to see tens to hundreds of genes that were unique to each species, um, perhaps with one species having higher gene numbers than the other. Um, and then in addition to this, I also expected to see tens to hundreds of genes that were shared in common between the two species responses. So the second question I had focused on the relaxation recovery observed in the physiological data. And so this asked, do the gene expression profiles of fish sampled from relaxation treatments resemble those of the control fish, um, showing evidence of recovery at the molecular level and thereby supporting what we saw at the, physiolog the physiological level. So I hypothesized that fish sampled during the fluctuating relaxation conditions would exhibit gene expression profiles that do not reflect or are not similar to those ambient or control profiles. So the graph on the right here is an example of a heat map that helps us to display differences in gene expression profiles. And so here I have the example showing ambient profiles at the bottom left and relaxation profiles on the right. And I'll explain this graph a little bit more in my results. Um, but for right now, all you need to know is that the yellow and blue colors signify differences in gene expression while the black indicates little to no difference. And so um, if my data supported this second hypothesis, I expected to see significant differences in the expression profiles of ambient versus relaxation fish, evidenced by similar patterns of color or differences shown in this type of graph. However, if my data did not support this hypothesis, I expected to see few genes expressed between the two treatments um, and very similar profiles, which would show up with a lot less color and a lot more black when I displayed it on a graph like this. Then finally, um, the last question I had focused on correlating the gene expression to phenotypes or that physiological data. So this asked, how do each species gene expression responses correlate to the measured physiological responses from the same fish? So I hypothesized that gene expression for each species would reveal specific gene networks that are significantly correlated with physiological responses in the same fish. So um, in this case, if the data supported my hypothesis, I expected not only to see significant correlations, but also gene expression networks um, that mirrored the type of physiological responses that we were seeing. So for example, in fish that are showing symptoms of physiological stress, such as that increased breathing rate and reduced swimming ability, I expected to see correlations with the expression of gene networks that were related to the cellular stress response. So moving on into my methods. So um, approximately 100 young of year copper rockfish and 100 young of year gopher rockfish were collected on scuba with hand nets in Stillwater Cove, Carmel in California. And then once collected, these fish were transported back to the NOAA lab in Santa Cruz and tagged for later identification. So once back in the lab, um, all fish were randomly sorted into 10, or sorry, not 10, eight different treatment tanks. Um, so I'm gonna use the schematic to help represent the experimental design here. So um, each treatment had two replicate tanks. So we had two for ambient or control, two for extreme, two for upwelling, and two for relaxation. And then um, in each tank, we had a random assortment of 10 coppers and 10 gopher rockfish. 
So to look at the um, treatment parameters a little bit more closely, I'll be displaying them on this graph here. So the first treatment we had, again, was that control or ambient treatment. So this had a dissolved oxygen level of 8.0 milligrams per liter and a pH of 8.0. So this treatment represented um, our normal or ambient conditions that we would find out in the wild. And then we had another static treatment, which was the static extreme treatment. So this had a dissolved oxygen level of two milligrams per liter and a pH of 7.3. So the static extreme treatment represented our very hypoxic and very acidic treatment level. Um, some of those more extreme environments that the fish would experience out in the wild. And so then we had the first of our two fluctuating treatments. Um, and so this was the relaxation treatment. So with this treatment, um, it started at a dissolved oxygen and pH level that was at normal conditions. Um, so at that eight milligrams per liter and a pH of eight. And so it lasted at this, this parameter for eight days. Then it ramped down to have the next eight days be at those extreme hypoxic and acidic conditions. So this cycle went back and forth every eight days for the total of the 13 weeks of the experiment. And then our second fluctuating treatment was the upwelling treatment. So this fluctuated between the same normal and extreme parameters as a relaxation, but on an opposite time scale um, than the other fluctuating tanks. So it started instead with extreme conditions for eight days, and then it ramped up to those normal conditions for eight days, continuing that cycle back and forth again for the full eight, 13 weeks. And so I just want to stress that the notable difference between the two fluctuating treatments were that the fishes were sampled um, at the end of their corresponding treatments. So relaxation fish were sampled after eight days of normal conditions, whereas upwelling fish were sampled on the eighth day of those extreme conditions. So following this 13 week trial, um, the final length and weight were recorded for each fish. And then gill tissue was dissected and frozen frozen for RNA extraction. So the extractions were conducted using the Kyogen RNAZ Universal Kit. And I focused my research on investigating gill tissue based on the knowledge that they are a primary place for acid-base regulation, oxygen consumption, um, and they have naturally high levels of gene expression, but also because of the physiological effects that we observed um, in Melissa's study. Um, so in case, you're new to RNA sequencing, or perhaps you haven't taken a biology course in a while, um, I have a, a quick refresher here. So on the right is what's known as the central dogma of molecular biology, whereas we know that double-stranded DNA is transcribed into single-stranded RNA, which is then um, translated into the proteins that tell your cells how to function and control your body's processes. And so likewise, every cell in your body contains practically identical DNA that acts like a blueprint for all of your genes and your processes. But just because your cell has the blueprints doesn't mean that it's using them. Um, so we can learn what genes are being used in our cells and then therefore essentially what processes are taking place by looking specifically at the messenger RNA. So this is also known as mRNA um, and also comparing its relative abundance. And so this study of messenger RNA used or expressed within a certain cell or tissue and its collective functions is called transcriptomics. And so that's the study um, that I used for my thesis. And so then when we refer to RNA sequencing, we're referring to a technique that's used to conduct this type of research. So during my RNA sequencing methods, I first extracted mRNA from the gill tissue of my fish um, which again provided me the raw info about what genes were being used. Then I artificially translated the extracted RNA into double-stranded complementary DNA, also known as cDNA, which is a mouthful, but essentially we do this step purely because cDNA is more stable and doesn't degrade as quickly. So this created kind of collections of our gene material. And so then we took those collections, also known as libraries, and we sequenced them. And please understand, um, this is a very simplified representation of these methods. 
So for the purpose of time, I'm going to leave most of this as sort of a black box. Um, and if you have any specific questions about this process or RNA sequencing, I'm happy to answer them at a later date, or you're welcome to read my thesis once it's published or once it's submitted, I guess. And then um, in order to identify our genes from the sequence data, we need a reference to map the gene to. So this is a lot like searching for a word in a dictionary. Um, and so rockfish are what is known as a non-model organism. So this means that they don't have a published genome like humans or other traditionally researched species like rats, zebrafish, or mice. Um, so I had to make a reference for my data myself. And so this is known as creating a de novo transcriptome assembly or a reference assembly. And then finally, um, after all this, I could move on to my analyses. So following these initial processing steps, all data then underwent a series of statistical analyses to establish significant trends and correlations. So the first analysis was a differential gene expression analysis or DGE, um, which we used to pinpoint the genes that were being expressed as a direct response to our treatments. The next analysis that I used um, was completely separate from the first one. So this was a weighted gene correlation network analysis, also known as WGCNA. And so I used this in order to quantitatively identify gene networks that were significantly correlated to the physiological data from Melissa's, um, Melissa's study. And then finally, a secondary analysis for that was kind of downstream of the first two that I performed was a functional gene enrichment analysis. So this uses basically gene information or information about what the gene is um, to and a Fisher's exact test to determine which gene categories um, are significantly enriched or otherwise what we refer to as overrepresented in the expression data. So um, Another reason we can use this test is to help answer the question, what do these genes do? So now that we have a little bit more of an understanding of my methods, um, let's move into my results. So as a reminder, the first part of the results, I'll be discussing um, focus on my species comparison. So, and then for another added refresher, the following data aided to answer my first question that was looking at that cross species comparison. So before we move forward, um, I want to remind everybody that all organisms have a baseline of gene expression happening all the time in order for their bodies and cells to function normally. So when we study differential gene expression, um, what we are interested in are again, only the gene expression that is a direct response to our treatments or to the stimulus. So only that that is different from normal. And so for the purpose of these results, a very simplified way to think of gene expression is to think of an organism's genes turning up or turning down, like the volume on a stereo. Um, and this is done in order to control different bodily processes and cellular functions, again, as a response to stimulus. So if the gene is being turned up, that means the gene is typically being expressed more than normal um, or it's being upregulated. If the gene's being turned down, that means that the gene is being expressed less than normal or downregulated. And so to answer my first question, I performed again this DGE analysis um, on each species data set and then compared them. So this Venn diagram shows the difference between the differentially expressed genes um, for copper and gopher rockfishes across all treatments. So immediately you see that copper rockfish had almost four times as many differentially expressed genes in comparison to the gophers, which is pretty surprising given their closely matched physiological responses um, and given that they're pretty closely related um, evolutionarily as well. And so this wide difference is further highlighted by the relatively few number of shared genes between them. And so when I performed my enrichment analysis on these shared genes, I found that most of the overrepresentation was in genes that were functionally related to the regulation of multicellular organismal development. And so this is essentially a process that controls the rate or the extent of all kinds of multicellular development in animals. 
So the analysis of the gene lists that were unique to each species um, gave us gave me even more information about their different responses. So this number here represents the genes that um, or the total number of genes that were expressed only in the copper rockfish. And so this again was in response to all treatments. And so the gene enrichment analysis of this unique gene list showed that there were the most significant overrepresentation were in genes functionally related to nervous system development. And so this means that these genes were part of a process that controls the progression of nervous system tissues. So for example, this would include nerves, brain tissue, and synapses. And then what's even more interesting is that when we zoom in to look at the regulation of these genes, or essentially how they're turning up or turning down, um, we see that majority of them were turned down or downregulated in the fluctuating treatments, um, but they were upregulated or turned up in those static or linear treatments. So for a reminder here on the left, I have those fluctuating treatments. And again, those are the, our relaxation and our upwelling treatment. So in comparison, um, when we look at the gene enrichment for the gopher unique DE genes, we can see enrichment that is completely different. So um, the most significant representation or overrepresentation were in genes that were functionally related to the hypoxylin metabolic process. So this process is believed to function in promoting an inflammation response in this organism's body. Um, and so interestingly, in this case, these genes were also downregulated or turned down but instead of the fluctuating treatments, they were turned down in both extreme um, or acidic and hypoxic treatments. So they were turned down in the static extreme and the fluctuating upwelling treatment. So going back to our questions, these data support our first hypothesis, um, demonstrating clear and unique responses between copper and gopher species with the coppers expressing higher numbers of differentially expressed genes than gophers that are functionally related to different biological processes. And likewise, these data also support um, the second part of this hypothesis with both species sharing few, but nonetheless a distinct group of responsive genes. So what does this mean? Um, well, it indicates that even though we observed nearly identical responses between the species and the at the physiological level, um, we see that when we dive beneath the surface, their bodies are responding very differently um, on that molecular level. So this highlights the importance of measuring organism responses across multiple biological scales. These data then also indicate that each species is utilizing a different molecular mechanism to compensate for the acidification and hypoxia stressors. Furthermore, um, the larger DE gene numbers seen in copper rockfish could indicate a response that's considered more plastic or more tolerant to those combined fluctuating stressor conditions, um, especially in comparison to that of the gopher rockfish. So this type of more plastic or tolerant response has been previously observed between blue and copper rockfish in the Hamilton et al. 2017 study, where blue rockfish appeared to be more resilient than copper rockfish under ocean acidification stress. So similarly, when we look at the overall percentage of genes that fall into um, the cellular stress response category for each of my species, um, I found that genes made up 20.5% of the total response for copper rockfish compared to 22% of the total response for gophers. So admittedly, these numbers aren't drastically different um, and there's probably not anything statistically significant between the two, but these numbers may suggest a slightly less stressful molecular response in copper rockfish again, supporting greater plasticity and potential resiliency to climate change in comparison to the gophers. And then finally, um, these data highlight that small variations in early life exposure histories could be one of many things that are influencing this type of competition between the closely related species. So especially more so than maybe previously thought. Um, so in the case of these rockfish, it's possible that the greater plasticity exhibited by coppers is influenced by the potentially more exposure they have to fluctuating stressful conditions um, of upwelling during their recruitment period. <laughs>
So now um, kind of wrapped up with that first part of the results and I'm going to move on into the second half. And so just a reminder again, I'll be focusing this time on the individual species data to address my two other um, questions. And as an added reminder, so these questions focused on the relaxation recovery observed in the physiological data, as well as trying to correlate our gene expression to those physiological data as well. So I'll be beginning this section focusing on copper rockfish. And if at any point you get a little bit confused about which species we're talking about, look for this orange little copper rockfish guy on the slide in the corner. And so um, after seeing the large number of uniquely expressed genes overall in the copper data, I wanted to zoom in on that relaxation treatment to see if fish were showing signs of recovery at the molecular level, you know, like we were seeing at the physiological level. So for another added reminder on the left here is our relaxation fluctuating treatment. So again, these guys were sampled on the eighth day of that normal, those normal conditions. So this pie chart represents the overall differentially expressed genes um, for the relaxation versus ambient treatment comparison. So the gray circle in the middle represents the total number of genes, while the yellow represents upregulation or those genes turning up, and the blue represents downregulation, um, also the genes turning down. So um, from this, pie chart, you can see that almost two thirds of the genes in the relaxation treatment were turned up or upregulated in comparison to control. So another way to look at these data um, is to display them in a heat map like this on the right. And so this allows us to look at them a little bit more visually. So each um, horizontal bar represented in red here represents a specific or a single gene while each vertical bar represents an individual fish. So upregulation again is represented by yellow and downregulation or that turning down is, is depicted in blue. And so what we see here um, in this graph um, is that expression data are grouping by treatment. So if you look at the bottom there, A1 and A3 represent those ambient fish while R2 through four represent our relaxation fish. So we see relaxation profiles grouped on the right with ambient profiles grouped on the left. Um, and so this is showing distinct differences between the relaxation and the ambient profiles. Um, especially we are seeing strong upregulation of a pretty large section of genes, again, almost two thirds in the fish from the relaxation treatment while we're seeing a, a corresponding down regulation of those in the ambient fish. Um, however, though, if you zoom in to relaxation fish number four, we're seeing some interesting individual variation in this small chunk of genes that was turned down or down regulated. And so in this chunk, this individual fish is more similar to the profiles of those ambient fish than its own treatment cohorts. So next, I wanted to look at how gene expression for this species correlated with our measured traits. And so to, to display these data, um, I use a different heat map, like the one displayed here. So the left of this heat map, C1 through C19, represent each individual module. Um, and so those modules represent highly correlated gene networks and their, dis their expression. Then on the right um, is the color legend. So this represents the strength of the correlation between our expression and those traits. And so red represents more positive correlations while blue represents negative correlations. And then in each of the cells highlighted here, you can see um, numbers. And so those represent the correlation strength um, specifically. And so these are shown only for the correlations that passed a statistical Pearson's R test with a p-value significance of less than 0.05. And then at the bottom there are the trait data that we're trying to compare the gene expression to. So the left three are the physiological measurements from Melissa's study, and the two right are categorical traits that represent um, our, the, the treatments that we were most interested in. So those both of those fluctuating treatments. So to break the tra trait data down a little bit further, um, the aerobic scope 
is a measurement that measures capacity for aerobic activity. And so this can be used essentially as a proxy for whole organismal performance and fitness. And so when we see a decrease in aerobic scope, that typically is synonymous with an increase in stress in the organism, which results in an overall decrease in fitness over time. Likewise, for critical swimming speed, um, this is a stress test that measures a fish's maximum prolonged swimming velocity. So for this, a decrease in critical swimming speed indicates an increase in stress in the organism um, and an overall decrease in fitness over time. And then finally, the, aerob or, sorry, the average ventilation rate is a measurement of increased breathing in response to hypoxia. And you can think of this essentially as hyperventilating for fish. And so in this case, an increase in average ventilation rate represents an increase in stress for the animal and an overall decrease in fitness over time. So um, looking at the WGCNA data for the coppers, unfortunately in this data set, we didn't see too many significant modules that correlated with the physiological measurements. Um, however, one module that appeared to have fairly strong biological significance is its or in its correlations um, was module C14. So the data represented in this module showed that copper rockfish who were breathing faster or the fish that had moderately high to, av to high average ventilation rates, overwhelmingly, they were turning down a gene network that was related to RNA splicing. And so RNA splicing is a cellular process involved in the general processing of new messenger RNA. And so there's different studies that have um, kind of been establishing the connection between RNA splicing regulation and stress response in animals. So to recap these results, I know that was a lot. I hope you're still with me. Um, these copper rockfish data support our second hypothesis, showing that the expression profiles of fish that were sampled during those relaxation periods did not closely match or reflect those of the ambient or controlled fish. However, um, in this situation, and especially in relaxation fish number four, we did observe individual variation um, that showed that individual responded somewhat more similarly to the ambient fish in one chunk of genes than it did to its treatment cohorts. And then likewise, these copper rockfish WGCNA data also support my third hypothesis, um, showing specific gene networks that were significantly correlated um, to observed physiological traits in the same fish. So specifically, we saw that fish who were breathing faster were also down-regulating or turning down gene networks that were significantly related to RNA splicing. So moving on to the gopher rockfish results. Again, if you get confused in this section about what species we're talking about, look for this brown little gopher guy in the corner. Um, and so this panel is laid out the same as those copper data that I just showed you. So again, the yellow colors represent turning up genes or upregulating, while the blue represent down or turning down. Um, and so looking at the pie chart for the gophers, we see significantly less genes overall as in the total expression. Um, and about half of these genes are in the relaxation treatment were upregulated in comparison to control. So then when we look at these data more visually in our heat map, um, we see here that the expression data are again grouping by treatment. So this again indicates gene expression of the relaxation fish that is significantly different to that of the control fish. So you can again see that A2 and A3, those represent our ambient fish on the left and they're grouping differently from R2 through four, which are the relaxation fish. Um, again, here you might have already picked out as well, we are also seeing some more that of, of that interesting individual variation within the relaxation fish specifically. So um, in each of these fish, there's another chunk of genes or a different chunk of genes that is regulated more similarly to those control fish profiles than it is to its own treatment cohorts. Then when we look at the WGCNA data, um, immediately you can probably see that there's more significant correlations across the traits 
than what we saw with the coppers. And you can see that because we're seeing more numbers in those cells. Um, for the sake of time today, I'm only going to discuss the most interesting module, which is G, module G4. Um, so this module displays the most biologically meaningful data out of the full set. And so the data in this module tell us that gopher rockfish um, that were subjected to the fluctuating upwelling treatment respond with physiological and molecular signs of stress. So more specifically, um, these data show us that the gopher rockfish under upwelling showed an overall decrease in fitness, a decreased swimming performance, and an increased breathing rate. So meanwhile, at the molecular level, these fish were also turning up or upregulating gene networks that are related to the cellular stress response. So again, um, together, these data are a really strong representation of total organismal stress under those fluctuating, re or, sorry, <laughs> fluctuating upwelling conditions. So to recap these results, um, these gopher data, wow, words are hard, gopher rockfish data also support our second hypothesis showing that the expression profiles of fish that were sampled during the relaxation period, again, did not closely match or reflect those of the ambient or control fish. However, we did again see the examples of individual variation, and this time probably more so than we saw in the coppers. Among those relaxation fish that showed some of the individuals were responding more similarly um, to the ambient fish than to their treatment cohorts. And then likewise, the gopher rockfish WGCNA data strongly support the third hypothesis as well, um, clearly demonstrating correlations between the measured traits and the gene expression. And so these correlations are, again, highly indicative of both a physiological and a molecular stress response under fluctuating upwelling conditions. So what does all of this mean again? Um, so these data indicate that even though the closely related species seem to recover physiologically during those relaxation periods, significant gene expression responses remain at that molecular level. And so um, especially in the case of copper rockfish, this residual expression could be another indicator of a plastic or more anticipatory response where organisms are maintaining expression of a baseline of responsive genes um, that kind of help them to cope with the consistent environmental changes. So this concept has been well demonstrated in other studies of fishes under predictable and cyclic stressor conditions. Um, but a very recent study suggests that this coping mechanism may only be attainable under more predictable stressor environments. So again, if you look at this graph on the right, upwelling by nature is relatively unpredictable to begin with. And so it's undoubtedly also expected to become more unpredictable as climate change progresses. And so because of this, um, it's possible that the potentially resilient, potentially plastic response that we're seeing in coppers will disappear and the rockfish's ability to cope with changing conditions will decrease over time. But um, in order for us to know for sure, we really need more studies that are utilizing those unpredictable fluctuating treatments um, to, to, to understand. And then finally, um, the WGCNA data better illuminate a multi-scale stress response, especially in the gopher rockfish under those fluctuating upwelling conditions. So these help us to create a picture of whole organism effects of the OA and hypoxia stress. And it also kind of quantitatively connects the dots for us between the physiological and gene expression data sets. Um, so in this presentation of my thesis, you might already realize, but this is just a small snapshot of the total data um, that I was able to collect in this study. So if you wanna know more, you can read my thesis. <laughs> But unfortunately, um, one drawback about these data are that they are limited by sample size um, and especially in my study. So though I'm seeing some extremely interesting trends, I do know that having greater sample sizes would allow my conclusions to be more powerful and more confident. And so I think that um, for the future, studies should probably consider this analysis when planning their experimental design. Um, it's an incredibly useful tool, especially in trying to connect those dots again between the physiology and the gene expression. Um, but there needs to be um, for kind of a 
forward thinking when it comes to planning for the sample size. So in conclusion, to kind of summarize everything presented today, um, these data suggest that copper rockfish may be more resilient than gophers to future upwelling conditions. And so this is probably a result of greater early life history exposure and acclimation to fluctuating stressor conditions. And so these data also highlight the importance of understanding individual species responses, even in closely related species, to future upwelling and other climate change conditions. And then additionally, gene expression data revealed that the physiological recovery that we observed in those relaxation periods um, from Melissa's study is not reflected at the molecular level in either species. So this residual expression could prove detrimental over time as upwelling becomes more unpredictable. And it also emphasizes the need to not only utilize multiple biological measurements to assess the effects of environmental stressors, but also emphasizes a push for environmental treatments that are as close to the conditions in nature as possible. And then finally, um, the measurements of physiological stress are significantly correlated with stress-related gene expression in those gopher rockfish under the fluctuating upwelling conditions. So hopefully future studies can utilize tools like WGCNA to make similar connections to help us have um, a better whole organism response of other species and organisms. So at this point, um, you may, I hope you're not thinking, but you might be thinking, why should we care? Well, differences in species vulnerability to ocean acidification, hypoxia, and other climate change stressors can impact coastal community structures as well as coastal ecology and their economies over time through the loss of biodiversity. So this usually happens when species that are more vulnerable to environmental stressors disappear more quickly um, because they're not able to compete in those environments. And so ocean acidification and hypoxia are also only two examples of many environmental changes and stressors that are co-occurring with climate change. So today fish populations are, um, and, and other marine species as well, are feeling the pressure from things like warming ocean temperatures, overfishing and bycatch, pollution, habitat loss um, from coral bleaching like shown on the top, and the loss of kelp forests, like shown at the bottom, as well as toxic algae blooms. And so having a better understanding of the vulnerable species, like shown in the data from my thesis, can help us to have more informed and better conservation and management practices. So not only with these important rockfish species, but others as well that might be undergoing similar environmental stressors. So one applied example is that these data provide motivation to protect vulnerable species like gopher rockfish by updating fisheries regulations that can help ease the fishing pressures on their populations while we attempt to slow or mitigate the effects of climate change. And so hopefully through the continued studies um, of this type of work and similar applied practices, we can work to preserve the diversity of our coastal populations. So um, if you're still with me here, thank you. Um, I'm glad that you made it this far. Obviously this project was just one of a massive project studying ocean acidification and hypoxia on rockfishes. Um, and it required a lot of collaboration and help from a lot of people. So I tried to get as many people as I could think of on the slide here. If I've forgotten anybody, I do apologize. Um, there's obviously so many people to acknowledge here, but I just obviously first wanted to start um, by acknowledging and thanking Scott and Cheryl um, for not only providing amazing guidance and mentorship throughout my project, but also for just initially giving me um, the opportunity to do this work and adopting me into both of your labs, especially at a time when I was feeling a, a bit lost in the program. Um, I don't think you guys understand how much you both helped to turn my entire experience around and you helped me to feel extremely welcome right from the beginning. So I, I could not thank you enough for that. Um, and I also want to thank John, one of my committee members, for your willingness to join my committee and occasionally um, you know, delve into the fish world, especially when I know it's outside your typical invertebrate studies realm. 
Um, so you've always provided great genetics perspective from outside that fish bubble, and that's always been really useful. So I'm really appreciative of that as well. And of course, thank you to Nate, my fourth committee member as well, for not only being a seemingly um, limitless resource of bioinformatics expertise, um, especially when I needed it, but also showing so much patience um, while I took the time to catch up and get my head wrapped around things. Um, you also really helped to fill in gaps while Cheryl was away on her amazing sabbatical that one semester. Um, and so your, your guidance during that time and through the last few years has been really helpful. Um, so if you don't know, maybe some of you don't already know, but I, I came onto this project a little bit later in the game than most people. And so I didn't get a chance to be a part of all the experimental work that went into um, the setup in the beginning. So I did wanna say thank you so much to the other PIs for facilitating the project. Um, and also a huge thank you to all of the colleagues and helpers that not only helped like set everything up, but collect these data and made sure the experiment ran smoothly. Um, I don't know, again, if I've captured everybody here. Uh, hopefully I have, but um, if you see somebody that's not here, please extend my uh, gratitude to them. But I especially wanted to thank Kristen and Melissa for taking on this big experiment during your first two years in the program. I know you guys had different portions of the Rockfish project, but you dedicated a lot of time to, to those experiments. Um, in the beginning and made it possible for people like me that came in later down the line to kind of pick up the pieces and run with it. Um, so I also wanted to thank the Logan Labbies, past and present, as well as the Ichthyology Labbies. Um, not only did you guys make me feel welcomed into the lab when I switched in, um, which was really important to me, but you also were an amazing support throughout the last few years. So whether it was commiserating over coding, um, and programming work or providing feedback during lab meetings that really just helped me, you know, keep moving along or helping out during extractions or even just grabbing a beer together after a long day and chatting about life during downtime. Um, each and every one of you really has greatly impacted my experience for the better. And I'm just so grateful for everything that you offered. Um, and I guess, of course, the same goes for the whole Moss Landing community as well. So. Many of you made a huge impact on my time in the program. Um, I don't know if you know it, but you did. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for everything that you do to keep MLML running smoothly. So especially Michael and Rhett, um, if you're still watching, a special thank you to you guys for hiring my, me in my first year. It really just gave me this most amazing introduction to Moss Landing as a whole and kind of brought me in. It helped me tr transition really well um, before school started that year. And I just really enjoyed learning from and working with both of you. And I'm just so amazed every day still at everything that you guys do to put out daily IT fires and um, just keep, keep Moss Landing running as the well-oiled machine that it is. Um, also a special shout out to Michelle and Chris. You guys were also both some of the highlights of my days. Again, I don't know if you know this, but you definitely were the highlights of my days at the labs. I could always look forward to wonderful conversation with both of you, very warm greetings, you know, big smiles, and definitely on days that I was having um, kind of a low day, you could help turn it around with just a conversation. So I really appreciate that. Um, and then finally, I'm trying not to drag on too long here, but uh, for Tara, I honestly, I. I don't think the student body could function without you. Um, you provide such an undervalued resource to the students and you're always so warm and welcoming again um, and just ready to listen to all of our problems and help find a solution. Uh, so you, you obviously helped me so much by helping me navigate some extremely difficult situations and decisions um, throughout my time in the program. And so I just truly wouldn't have been able to be here today without you. Um, and so I just want to thank you so much. Um, and I guess I couldn't end this presentation without taking another minute to thank, you know, just all of the wonderful human beings that have become and became my second family at Moss Landing and during my time in California. So it is sad I'm not in California anymore. I'm in North Carolina. So I have a bunch of these loves from across the country. <laughs> um, but 
not only do I just really consider myself so lucky to have met all of you and have made special connections, you know, especially with people from inside my cohort, but also outside of it as well. So one way or another, Moss Landing kind of helped me find all of you. And a lot of you are now a permanent fixture in my life, whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, so you made the last five years um, the amazing adventure that it was. And there's truly not enough words to express the love and appreciation that I have for all of you. And then the last one, I promise, um, I just wanna say thank you so much to my family. Um, I couldn't have made it through these years or probably even gotten to this point in my life without all of your love, your encouragement and your support. Um, and so I especially want to thank this guy on the left here who is keeping our dogs contained in the living room so they don't cause a ruckus during this. Um, but not only did you put up with my Halloween costume demands, you also were my rock when I was too stressed to function some days. You helped motivate me when I was ready to quit like so many times, especially after some code just wasn't running right. Um, and you really just embraced every adventure that was thrown our way, not only just like in my five years in the program, but also just during our time in California in general, and then our move to North Carolina. So this is all while going to law school and working as a patent attorney. So I just appreciate you um, more than words could ever say. So with that, um, if you've again made it this far, thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, and at this time, I'm excited to take your questions. Great, wonderful job, Holly. Um, thank you so much. So we'll we'll have a little bit of time at the end for us to all unmute and um, turn our videos on to thank Holly. But for now, um, I'd like to field questions for Holly. So again, you can use the raise hand feature um, that's under the reactions button in Zoom. And I already see a few questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with uh, Jason. Go ahead. <clears throat> We're not hearing anything. You may need to unmute if you're still with us. Oh, there I am. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. No Be worries. Absolutely beautiful presentation. Slides were spectacular. Thank you. Uh, but I have some lingering questions from early on in your transcriptomic analysis. Yeah. You clearly demonstrated that uh, they don't or they share very little in terms of differential differentially expressed genes under the stress conditions, 36 or some small number, but uh, how did uh, the total protein coding gene abundance compare between the two species? Are they super different or does that explain the difference in abundance of differentially expressed genes? Um, because there just weren't similar numbers of genes that could be expressed. Yeah, um, so if I'm understanding correctly, maybe you're asking a little bit more about the proteomics of things? No, uh, your de novo assembly. You should have gotten a oh. count for total protein coding since you're looking yeah. at an RNA, total okay. gene counts. That is a great question and um, actually something that is is I'm still working on to kind of clean up. Um, so again, I did have to create a, a new assembly. Um, and so I created essentially assemblies for each species, but then I chose, I, I mapped all my samples to those transcriptomes. And then I chose the one that had the highest mapping race across all the species um, to, to try and kind of block out some of the noise. So the one that I chose was the copper rockfish transcriptome. Um, and it, it was pretty high in its gene numbers. Mm -hmm. So higher than we would expect to see probably um, that's realistic as far as the number of genes in coppers. Um, so I'm, I'm still kind of working out the kinks of that. Um, the one good thing that I'm confident about in my data is when I went through my analyses, I did um, have enough kind of stringent statistical parameters to filter out some more of that noise um, that was coming from those higher gene numbers. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that I, I do have you know, more unique genes represented in my gene lists that um, are, are giving me kind of an accurate portrayal of the mm -hmm. response. And then the uh, similarity between the, the you know, called genes that are the same functionality, or are they highly, I, 
again, I don't know how diverse rockfish are aside from the color. <laughs> Body wise, they all look the same, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you, but mean you get like, a good feel for what the diversity difference is between the two species. Similarity, um, so you mean over, overall kind of like the categories of the genes that we're seeing and the function? Yeah, or actual, you know, one on one comparison. So an act, actin and one versus actin and the uh, copper. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, as far as um, kind of like shared orthologs is what they call where you can have like the, the different, um, okay, let me start over. So by having it mapped to the one transcriptome allowed me to um, identify only shared orthologs. So those are the transcripts that are represented in both species that can code for that gene. So that kind of helped me to like not have to worry about transcripts that weren't matching up in each species that were coding for the same gene. Um, mm. As far as, I guess, kind of like the, the functional categories go and things, overall, the gopher seemed to have a lot more that was related to the cellular stress response. So there was a lot more that I looked at in even like the different treatment comparisons um, and things like that. And so gophers kind of repeatedly seemed to have more of those CSR related genes popping up in their representation than the coppers. Um, is, I'm not sure if that actually answers your question. Uh, sort of, uh, <laughs> and a, a, fi a final one. And uh, I know you said you sampled the fluctuating conditions at the end of the eighth day. Were all that were the two uh, tests, the ambient and the stress, sampled on the same day or were they sampled um, the yeah. prior eight days before the, the switching? Yeah, no. So um, si since all the tanks were set up to kind of run on their own time scale at the same exact time, as far as I understand, they were all sampled on the same sampling day. So yeah. the, the differences were just between those fluctuating so it, it takes mm -hmm. Takes away any developmental contribution. Right. And then, okay, one more final. Everything was run <laughs> yeah. at the same, same, you didn't put temperature in as a, a, the third right. correlated stressor in, in there. So it's all, so RNA turnover yeah, could be yeah. The, the same. Uh, right. Okay. Temperature was definitely all controlled. Um, I know there's other experiments that have started trying to look to add in temperature because obviously with climate change, that's another added stress. Mm -hmm. And we could see, you know, either effects that are compounding on the effects that we're already seeing with the acidification and hypoxia, or we could see some like interacting effects that are changing the way they're responding to all those three stressors. So we didn't look at that, but that's obviously a really interesting question and something that needs to be considered because it's another factor in the equation, right, out in nature. So if we're going to have a better understanding um, that's definitely something that's going to need to happen down the road. Yeah. And I would, I would put on the list doing a, uh, some sort of time series analysis so you can get at, you know, whether the patterns you're looking at are pulled over from coming from the stressful condition or vice, vice versa. Yeah. Could be influenced by how fast those RNA pools are, because you're not really looking at expression, you're looking at pool size. So right. you need to get a growth or a turnover rate in there to uh, it just it's just the way it is. So, but beautiful data, really cool. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, and then we have another question from Melissa. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, Holly. Amazing job. Um, you've done such a great job um, talking about this crazy large data set and really um, funnel it down to more easily understandable presentation. So yeah. very much appreciate that. Um, I had a question about that um, inter-individual variation that you showed on your heat maps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, like, do you know what that variation is? Like what genes are in there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I haven't gotten that that far quite yet, but it's on the list of things to do. And I think it's something that I'm definitely going to try to pinpoint for publication, um, because obviously there's probably an interesting story there. Um, so the, the tricky part is gonna be if all of those genes have some sort of actual identification and representation or what we call obviously annotation on a database somewhere, um, which 
I've, I've kind of delved into that already a little bit. And I do know that at least some of those genes are annotated. So that's a good sign so that I can go and figure out what they are. Um, and so I know another thing too that I'm looking into for the publication is um, there's other studies that have seen similar in inter-individual variation, especially in responses to climate change stressors. Um, so it's kind of a, an interesting hot topic as far as like, you know, speculating how different pressures of climate change on a broader time scale could eventually lead to, you know, selection on individuals, whatnot. But so other studies, essentially what I'm getting at here is other studies can calculate the inter-individual um, variation coefficient. So it's like a measurement of how much variation you have between your samples. So that's another thing that I'm going to be looking into and probably working on for the publication. Very cool. Excited to see that. Awesome. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Scott, go ahead. <laughs> I'll ask a question. Yeah. So as I'm thinking about sort of the differences between the coppers and the gophers. And right, the gophers had much lower levels of differential gene expression. Right. Yet, no when you look at all the genes, right, there were much stronger correlations with the physiological responses. So what do you what do you think is happening there it might sort of explain that that kind of yeah. pattern? Um, so my best guess with that is that I guess there, there's just a clearer, clearer expression in general that that WGCNA analysis is able to pick up. But I think it's also, you know, somewhat of an example again of just the stress response that's happening. So they're they're seeing you're able to see those strong correlations because they are showing strong express of stress at the cellular level, and that's correlating and going together with the strong stress at the physiological level as well. Um, and so I think that that kind of a little bit bolsters the argument of the coppers being more resilient. So since we're not seeing like quite as much of that really strong stress sig signal um, on the molecular level, especially correlating with those phenotypes, um, it, it again, it could mean that they have what we're calling more of a preparatory or an anticipatory response. So that just kind of means that instead of their bodies waiting until after the stress happens to then respond and produce genes to help mitigate that those those changes. They kind of have like a base level of expression happening all the time. So that base level is helping them almost like put on a molecular suit of armor in a sense to, to try to prepare for the next round of change, the next round of stress that's coming. And so that's that could explain why we're seeing higher numbers of expressed genes in general in the coppers as well. Thanks. Great job, Holly. Thank you. Um, I see a question from Kate. Kate, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, Holly. Hey. <laughs> um, great job on the presentation. Um, you talked a little bit about future directions, and this project obviously seems like a great project that either future grad students could build upon or either you build upon. Do you have any ideas of how they could do that? Yeah, um, actually, I have a lot of ideas. <laughs> so it's funny because this was a pretty big project in and of itself, but um, as ambitious as we were when we started, there was a, another portion that was supposed to be done. So I kind of have a two part answer to this question, I guess. Um, so, so the first part, the, the portion that was supposed to also be done with these data that I was supposed to also maybe do was to try to look again at more of a total organism response by comparing gene expression in multiple different tissue types. So um, I still think that's a really important avenue to take. Again, there's not a ton of studies that have looked into that yet. So it'd be really, really good for us to have kind of a broader snapshot of what's going on with these fish. If we were looking also at the gene expression of their brain or like their muscle tissues, their liver tissues, things that all could be being affected by the hypoxia and the acidification. Um, and so 
those tissues were collected um, and I did the RNA extractions for them that same summer that I did the gill. Um, and I started doing the bioinformatics works for that. But again, it just kind of became too much and I had to decide, okay, let's just focus on the gills. So that's something that hopefully another student can pick up. And actually one of Cheryl's other students is working on this really cool project where he's taking some of those data um, and building a kind of universal rockfish transcriptome from those. So that would be really interesting. And so even if, even if nobody takes that study, I think it'd be interesting for future um, ocean acidification and hypoxia studies to go that direction. And then I guess the, the second part of this is something that I already kind of touched on. Um, and I just think it's really important for any future studies looking into any type of climate change stressors, but especially those that are looking at upwelling stress, um, to try to do something that can really accommodate for those, those conditions in a more natural setting. So that's another thing that we attempted a little bit, um, kind of as a side project in, in Cheryl's lab, where we would go out and we would try to predict an upwelling event. And so we go out and we try to sample fish during the upwelling. Um, and then on the boat, we would do like the dissections and freeze them and stuff and take our samples and everything. And so that's something that I think would be really, really important to have another study kind of continue in that direction. Because if we could get, you know, gene expression samples from fish pulling them straight out of the water, like before, during, and after upwelling, we would have probably a really more accurate portrayal of what's going on molecularly, especially because they're actually getting, you know, those unpredictable treatments, whereas in our lab, you know, we, we can only work with so much. So, I mean, kind of in addition to that, even if people are still doing things in the lab in the future, I think it would be beneficial to set up experiments that have a less predictable time scale. So instead of like, fluctuating every eight days, they're kind of bouncing around like today's two days, tomorrow is eight days, the next is like four days, you know, so it's it's less of a predictable time scale. Thanks, Holly. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, um, the next step is that we're gonna we're gonna all unmute and share a video if you feel comfortable with that, and give Holly a huge round of applause. So please join me. Woohoo! Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly. Hey, Holly.